creates in spirituality. The main thing that those people are worried about is really the dying of Mother Earth, as they say, and that uh, they try to find resources within the various religious traditions to help us to deal with the environmental crisis. And tonight, I want to talk about creation spirituality as a response to patriarchy, to sexism, to, and to dualism. Oh, as soon as we start talking about this topic, we have to bring up Matthew Fox and uh, say a few words of, about Matthew Fox. Um, one way of uh, thinking of Fox, I think, is uh, to try to locate him in the various ways that religious people act. Uh, I think that if we think of Matthew Fox and his writings as being uh, strict systematic theology as we've often known it, then it, it really doesn't fit into that genre, nor uh, does it really stand up in that world. As I told you before, the, the serious theologians really uh, don't comment by and large on Fox's work. But uh, I don't think that's the only way to look at it, nor do I even think it's the correct way to look at it. It'd be easy to shoot it down uh, from a theological viewpoint. A lot of the stuff he says, I mean, just uh, probably wouldn't hold water if you really tried to attack it from various angles. But I think Fox functions in a very different way. And as I'm talking, I'm suddenly realizing that people might not know who he is at all. He's a Dominican priest, you know, and he's written on this creation spirituality, and he says his name that's associated with it. And uh, he has been recently silenced by the Vatican and is in a one-year period where he's not allowed to lecture or to preach or to uh, speak publicly at all on any of these questions. So the way I, I, I'm beginning to see Fox more clearly is in other categories. For one, as a prophet. In other words, he's got uh, an axe to grind. He thinks things are wrong in the world. And he's going to go out and he's going to straighten them out. And I also see him as sort of a guru, uh, a, a person who is a, a spiritual director of sorts, who uh, is trying to help people to grow and develop in a healthy way. I see him as a bearer of wisdom, when someone is trying to take hold of the wisdom tradition in various religious backgrounds and trying to make that available for the rest of us. And so this whole idea of creation spirituality is really an invention of Matthew Fox. I mean, it's not even clear that such a thing exists apart from his mind. Um, in other words, if you would just get the tradition uh, objectively and read it, I mean, it's not clear that there's a whole long series of thinkers and outlets that can either be grouped the idea of creation spirituality. Fox is done is to me is to isolate real concerns, real hurts that people have, real estrangements and alienations, and the, real, the things that are bothering people in their guts. And he is to liberate people. Uh, he talks about hundreds of thousands of people all around the world are part of his movement. Uh, he, you know, he thinks it's a major world event. And he, he talks about 25,000 people being just in his grouping here in the United States. But it seems to me what Bob's done is to touch deep hurts wounds that people have collected over years. Many have collected within churches and in the Christian traditions. And uh, he's recognized those and he's pulled them together and he's given them some coherence and he said, hey, there's, there's a healing for those. And he, he, he gets them arranged out there. There's the enemy. He's very clear on who the enemy is and it's represented by St. Augustine. St. Augustine's the enemy. He represents all that's sort of bad in the Christian tradition. And so it's very easy to, to put that figure up there and to shoot at him. And it, it makes people feel good when they shoot at Augustine. Uh, <laughs> knock him down makes many people feel good, even if they never heard of St. Augustine. Because it, it doesn't matter because he represents sort of everything that's wrong. He sort of collects everything that's wrong and negative and limited in the tradition. And so in its place, then Matthew Fox brings in uh, elements that are holistic and healing and integrated and constructive. And one gets a very positive sense out of his readings. So that's partly the, the way I want to understand Fox as one who really is in touch with the spiritual pulse of many people and who said very important things about how to 
heal ourselves and move forward. He's a spiritual guy. He's writing books like it's to us and saying, hey, you feel bad about yourself or the world or your relationships. I know how to help you with that. He's a guru for many people. The other persons that I mentioned there in the introductory remarks, uh, another person is Thomas Berry. Barry writes about the same things, and uh, I feel that he writes in a, with deeper penetration and a better understanding of the tradition and of history. He's not nearly as popular, but uh, if people want to read some of his work, an excellent work is uh, The Dream of the Earth, which pulls together many of his ideas. Now tonight, uh, the, the topic uh, has to do with sexism, and I use that sort of symbolically uh, to represent uh, all that's uh, sort of wrong with the culture, as Fox would do it. it. It is to talk about patriarchy and what's at the root of all of that, and that is the whole idea of dualism. And that will be a theme throughout for us to try to understand what these people mean by dualism and how they're going to, to overcome part of that. I did, just let me go back to a point that I ran over too quickly about Thomas Berry and Matthew Fox in, in uh, comparing those two. Uh, Berry is much the more radical thinker. Uh, for Berry, the, the Christian tradition isn't very helpful anymore. It's sort of messed up pretty much. Uh, he is a priest, by the way, and a uh, passionist. But he, he's not happy with the Judeo-Christian tradition. I mean, he finds more wisdom in Indian spiritualities, for example. And what he especially finds wisdom in is what he calls the earth story. And that is that, that long story of the whole history of the universe that takes us back some 15 billion years ago the original Big Bang, as they say, and includes a 4.5 billion year history of the earth and a 4 billion year history of life on this earth and a couple million year history of the human race. And what Barry's very insightful point is, and I, I want to bring that out from what I talked about last week, is that that now becomes the one common element that can pull all of the people on the globe together. We're all the product of that history. And every student now, anywhere around the world, who begins to study modern science or evolutionary theory in any way, now can be part of that story. You don't have to be a Christian or a Buddhist or anything else. You just have to become educated in the modern world and now we begin to recognize that we live on this planet Earth and have a common destiny and a common history. In fact, maybe you don't even have to go to school to do this. You have to just have a television set sometime on when they show pictures of the Earth from space or pick up Time magazine or its counterpart around the world and see a picture of planet Earth. And so what Barry says is that if we're ever going to get it together, we've got to find something that binds us. What happens with the world religions is that it divides us. Like here's Islam and here's Judaism and they're fighting. And here's Islam and here's Christianity in the West and that becomes a source of division for us. The world religions separate us. In fact, uh, Hans Kung, who many people uh, recognize as an important Catholic theologian today, recognizes that problem and is spending all of his time and energy these days trying to overcome that precise point. How can we get world peace when we've got religions being part of the problem? You've got Catholics and Protestants fighting in Northern Ireland. Christians and uh, Muslims, Jews and Muslims. So what we're looking for, let's Barry's looking for, is some larger overarching framework within which we can find our commonality. We can be together. And Barry finds it in what he calls the earth story. And I think that's a striking kind of idea, and I believe it's one we can exploit. I, I used this image last uh, week from Barry to repeat it. He said, did everyone just look at their hand in front of you and realize that everyone's hand is a product of a 15 billion year process that contains those same elements that were in that original Big Bang, the supernova at the beginning. All there at the beginning. 
all evolved out of that through all those billions of years in which the evolutionary process groped its way forward and ran into dead ends and tried again and kept moving forward and eventually gets to life and to human life and the uniqueness of each one of us. That's the earth story as Thomas Berry tells us and it's a radical kind of story. Now in, con in comparison with that Matthew Fox is one who wants to draw on that Judeo-Christian tradition. I mean, he draws on in American Indians and, uh, and Hinduism and Buddhism and so on, but fundamentally when he goes back to find out how are we going to get it together and get justice and peace and harmony and overcome sexism and deal with our environmental crisis, he looks back at the mystics in the Judeo-Christian tradition. He goes back to what he calls the cosmic Christ. He tries to resurrect people like Julian of Norwich and uh, uh, Meister Eckhart, the great medieval mystics. So there again you get a comparison between these two uh, important figures in this creation spirituality movement. On the first page I've mentioned some books that I'll be drawing on today for the people who want to check all of that out. Now, the first... Uh, well, the major point that we want to talk about tonight uh, surfaced last week, and that is uh, the relationship between uh, feminism and sexism on the one hand and the, and the uh, ecological movement on the other hand. And uh, there's many there are many authors who see those things as common and put them together. Uh, and if they, probably the overarching category that many of these authors see is patriarchy. So the patriarchy is a word that describes the negative situation in which we've got sort of a masculine, rational, controlling, dominating attitude at work in the world in which, by and large, men dominate women and uh, men dominate nature and exploit women and exploit nature. As Thomas Berry likes to point out, and I checked this, I mean, the, the dictionaries, at least up to the ones I've looked at, or the encyclopedias, do not define patriarchy like that. If you read the definitions, they're not that negative. But the word in the very recent past, in popular uh, understanding, has come to mean uh, this very destructive and negative societal thing that we have going. And so um, some of the authors, and I'm drawing a lot here on Margaret Brennan, an IHM sister, who uh, has written some important things along this line, and she's talking about, well, what makes up this patriarchal society? And um, she sees four things, racism, sexism, the exploitation of lower classes, and the ecological destruction of the world. So that patriarchy, as they see it, is really built on that. That's how the whole system runs. It's a capitalistic system. It's a system of competition. And you've got to get ahead of other people and move up the socioeconomic ladder. You've got to find the way, various ways to, to try to tame the earth, to dominate it. And in that whole structure, there's going to be situations where various people are exploited. Now, behind patriarchy, as we're going to see throughout, is the notion of dualism. Rosemary Ruther thinks that dualism really is the original sin. And uh, Matthew Fox says the same thing. The sin behind all other sins is dualism. And uh, Thomas Berry thinks the same thing. So over and over, when you read these people, what's gone wrong, it is this idea of dualistic thinking, dualistic approaches to the world. And uh, those dualisms are of many sorts. And it's the dualism, for example, between grace and nature, between theology and philosophy, between men and women, between humans and non-humans, between soul and body, between God and creatures. So everyone, we can begin to multiply. So it is the idea that you've got those two elements there that are in some ways 
differentiated. But as Rosemary Ruther says, the fundamental or first lie that goes wrong in human thinking and human interactions is to take those two elements and to say one of them is higher, superior, dominant, and the other is inferior and is to be naturally dominated. It's to see the one as positive and the other one as negative. That right there becomes sort of the crux of the sexism problem as uh, many of these authors begin to see it. Thus, what happens, and here comes the link that we were talking about last week, and that is that in the polarities as they're played out, it's no doubt in the modern patriarchal society what is the dominant side of all of this. You know, it is soul over body. Soul superior and dominating a body. It's the humans to dominate nature. And it's the men to dominate the women. And what the other half the lower half, the inferior uh, polarity, has in common is this relationship to nature, to matter, to the natural world. And that becomes the way that women you know, are related to nature. Women, in, the, in much of the thinking in the patriarchal society, are, are associated with um, bodiliness, with nature, with matter, with natural cycles. There's all this is not surprising in terms of the menstrual cycle and so on. Just the dominant way of looking at life or at the, at the world. And so what happens is, is though all of those things get identified with the dark or the, that which is to be dominated and so on. So the linkage becomes that the males who are considered to be rational and in control, no less swept away in a sense, they are the ones who then control nature, which is to be dominated, and control women who partake of that whole natural world. Well, maybe we need to play that out a, a little bit more, but that's, you know, it seems as though that's the essential linkage. In other words, these authors claim it isn't just accidental that in, that in our society we both, uh, that nature is exploited and dominated and that women are exploited and dominated. That just is part of the overall outlook that we're going to find in dualism. Then uh, we have one author here that's talking about the fact of, you know, what goes wrong is this notion of machine. Now, here we get back to, to Newton and his idea that the world is like a large machine that God formed and started brilliantly and it sort of runs by itself now. The universe is thought of as a machine. And in the same way, women begin to be thought of as objects or sex machines, something to be used and dominated. So as soon as you get a machine-like mentality, then you're going to end up saying that exploitation is going to happen. In the patriarchal society, therefore, and this is one of the things Rosemary Ruther often uh, points to, is that women's experience then is either denied or when it is an important part of the whole mix, it gets erased. I suppose the more telling way of thinking about that are the biblical stories. I use this many times that we laud Abraham and his cleverness when he's walking around with his wife Sarah and he's in trouble and he palms her off as his sister and she's taken into Pharaoh's harem. And so the story is told from the viewpoint of Abraham, and this is sort of a clever ploy by Abraham. But what would happen if you told the story from the viewpoint of Sarah? Well, what, what would the story look like if you said it from Sarah's side, betrayed by her husband right when she needed him, used, 
sent off into a harem to be used as a prostitute. Oh, so that that is a way, a graphic way may of saying the way history gets written from uh, the masculine side and women's experience really is not accounted in any way. Some authors claim that really the key to overcoming the patriarchy and even overcoming the, the environmental problems is found in the male-female relationship. That if we can get that straightened out and learn to relate on the basis of mutuality, that it will bring into the human mix more of a sense of compassion and that that will sort of spill over into the way we begin treating the environment and the world of nature. Well, be that as it may, that whether that's true or not, that's uh, certainly how some people see it. So that's somewhat an attempt to put together the connections of why creation spirituality is interested in both of these topics. And they are major concerns, the environment and the situation of women in the culture. Creation is then seen as uh, somehow a way of overcoming those. Now the next section in the notes is a little bit of history taken from a cultural historian, that's Thomas Berry in one of his specialties and so on. Um, he sees a, a sort of a three-stage thing here, and I really don't know what to make of this. I think there's scholarly dispute about all of this, but his claim is that there really was a matriarchy to begin with, and then... Uh, from Europe 6500 to 3500 and then you had the taking over of patriarchy, a patrocentric period as he says. And then I suppose his contribution is to say that that is running its course. He look, when he looks at the world he sees all of these little movements. You know you got Greenpeace sort of confronting on the environmental questions. You've got the feminist movement in various parts of the world. You've got small groups of countercultural people gathering to say, well, we want to live in a different way in community and we don't want to exploit and so on. So he looks around and he sees all these things happening and he says, we're on the verge of a new era. And it won't be a return to matriarchy because that won't work. Because then you're just going to get a reversal somehow. And we see that, the extremes and the in the feminist movement, at least many of us detect that. I mean, where, where the lesbians want to go off and be by themselves, and they're still trying to figure out how they're going to propagate the race that way. And, uh, I mean, you know, you begin to wonder about what, where that's going to take us. And Barry says, well, that's not the way you go. You can't have another pendulum swing back to matriarchy or to goddess religions in that sense back behind the biblical tradition, but he wants to move in what he calls an omniscentric period, a term that he coined, in which the earth story will be dominant and in which now people will begin to relate on the basis of mutuality. In other words, he says, if you look around, you begin to see all kind of people who recognize this. I mean, I certainly sit in my office and talk to a lot of young people who are getting married who talk like that. I mean, they, they can't pull it off very often. They usually don't, but they talk about mutuality. And they get it as an ideal that they're really going to share and be part. And it's beautiful to hear. If you talk to them five years later, a woman will say, well, it was supposed to be 50-50. I would be like about 29. And I said, it's better than mother. You know, God. Um, anyway, you hear that claim of people who are recognizing that there's a new period upon us, and there's a new way of relating, and maybe we can indeed move along that line. Many of took their hands to the universe, being magnetized and scientists, but run the big way, and people that have this whole Earth story. It's a marvelous uh, imaginative recreation of this Earth story. Okay, all by way of background, uh, trying to get a hold of this whatever patriarchy is about. Again, uh, following Barry and some other authors, uh, he likes to, to point out that there is a number of different pillars that support patriarchy and uh, ways in which uh, we have uh, buttressed that idea or somehow enshrined it as being part of the divine will. And he talks about the usual empires where the king was seen as the embodiment of the divine and there was a, the, the king played that out, and that whole structure of the world that the king set up, therefore, had divine approbation. 
I was thinking of the, we still have that in Japan, the emperor worship, where the divine is seen as shining through the emperor, and that begins to set up a whole style in society. Did you notice they did all the studies in Japan? I mean, women are not doing great there. Um, and it's probably not surprising, given this analysis and this history of a cultural outlook uh, of the divine right of the ruler, which sets up the established order as being divinely sanctioned. I mean, you can't change things. If God set it up that men are supposed to be above women, well, then you can't run around changing it. That's very common today and in the fundamentalist Christian movement, as some people know. It's a good thing for women who are starting to move in the direction of becoming fundamentalists to ask themselves or for their friends to ask them. Do you really want to get into a situation where uh, our take each five literally seriously? That uh, the women are to be submissive to the men. Wives are subject to their husbands. Anyway, it's got that same sort of that. If that's a divinely approved self, then you can buy through the simple property in there. Well, there are institutions my that a nation state. And again, Barry is very strong on this of saying that uh, there's an aggressive side to this, and that it set up colonialism. Now, it's interesting to think about the conquest of the United States in this way, and the sort of dominating attitudes that one might ask what it sounds like to an Indian to say that Columbus discovered America, just for example. Uh, you know, what do you have to discover it for? I mean, you were here. You know, I mean, uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it, uh, much of the, the the thoughts about the Indians related showed again the way Indians were related to the wilderness. They were inhabited by the dark forces. They were almost demonic in ways. I mean, the, the wilderness that the settlers were facing had all kind of dangers lurking there. It was uh, inhabited by the, the scary and dark forces, but so, in the minds of some, this is not a total picture, but the, so were the Indians. The Indians were like that, and therefore they were to be treated like that. They were to be naturally the slaves, and to be, the only thing you do with the Indians is not to respect their religion, but to force them to be baptized and to become Christians. So the nation states set up this whole colonial empire, a very dominating and aggressive idea. And again, we begin to see how this plays in with the environment. The way that colonial people are looked at, you're supposed to go in and take them over because you're superior. But then you also use their land and resources to ship it back to the colonizing country so that all kinds of precious metals are sent back to Spain from the New World based on that idea. And many people would say that that's still the way it works today, as we talked about last week, when they chopped down the rainforest in Brazil, it is to create cattle ranches in order to be able to ship beef here in the United States to supply our fast food chains. So you get that same idea going of how these exploitations of people and of the environment seem to interlock and go together. And then Barry talks about the modern corporation. Uh, it gets bigger and often is exploited women. Very mixed picture these days. I mean, there's some women who graduate from this university and uh, get excellent jobs in corporations and move up rapidly. And uh, there's great opportunities for them. Uh, and then you've got other figures that say women are paid two-thirds for comparable work, etc. So it's certainly a mixed picture. Now, before I leave that page, with people turning the page, I want to go back to the second one, which is the one that, you know, is probably most important in many ways, and that is, as a patriarchal institution, is the church. And uh, it's important to realize the power and strength of the church throughout much of history, a uh, really dominating force. You realize the word of the church either controlled or interpreted almost every facet of life. For many centuries, if you were excommunicated, it meant something. If you're excommunicated today, I mean, no one would know the difference. You can still go shopping and buy things and get on the golf course or whatever. I mean, nothing seems to happen to you. But if you're excommunicated throughout much of the history of the church, it had economic and social and political implications. 
And uh, it was a matter of not being able to function in society if you were excommunicated. That's so what we had, uh, even in the times of the Inquisition, we had this interesting combination of church and state going together uh, to persecute uh, so-called heretics and so on. So we've got uh, all of this difficulty, and then we've got uh, the idea of uh, the religious interpretation of the role of women. And uh, we go back to, uh, to the story of uh, Adam and Eve as really being an important part of all of this in the religious world, and especially Paul's interpretation of that story. So as the story goes, the one who really introduced evil into the world is Eve. I mean, Adam's doing fine, but Eve's the one who messes it all up. And therefore, I mean, there becomes really a great uh, fear about women, and women become the scapegoat. This is in classical literature as well. It's in the story of Pandora, right? So Zeus decides to give gift, a gift to earthlings and uh, sends Pandora to uh, Earth as a gift, but Pandora takes a box with her and a box of troubles and... Naturally, Pandora opens the box and the troubles uh, spill out into the world. So it, both in classical literature and in religious literature, we've got the idea that the troubles in the world are ultimately set back to women. Women have caused that. And therefore, we begin in the church, uh, we've had a, a whole uh, idea like that that's been part of our, our Judeo-Christian heritage. And then we have the idea that Christianity really in, in Judaism arose in patriarchal cultures uh, in which the Bible is written by men and slanted that way. We have the fact that Jesus doesn't choose any women to be part of the inner circle, not part of the twelve, doesn't ordain any of them as we say today. Thus we have a continuing argument used that therefore women can't be ordained priests today. And therefore we have a situation in which women can't rise to the leadership functions in the church. Those are all reserved to men, celibate men at that. And uh, so this begins to color the way the whole institution works. I mean, it can't be any other way. Barry uh, points out, very interestingly, the role of Mary and the Madonna throughout history. There's always been another side to this. You know, and people who sort of uh, liberals who don't have much sense of Mary these days or think we ought to, you know, maybe sort of get rid of Mary or play down the Marian feasts and so on, I think that the cultural analysis begins to suggest something else about Mary. And even when our Protestant friends say, well, Catholics think that Mary is like a god, uh, there's a way in which I think they're right, the way Mary functions. Mary really did become very exalted and very much part of heaven and very much part of who's ever deciding things. It was that old idea that if you couldn't get sort of from Christ what you wanted, you talk to Mary and Mary would get it for you. It's almost as though Mary became a sort of a tempering force within the Christian outlook, the Madonna. Madonna tempered the authoritarianism and the harshness, even the harshness of God. God, boy, he's awesome, you don't want to fool with God and so on. But Mary, she's open and you can talk to her and identify with her and she'll get for you what you want from the great God. So that rule, there's a great ambivalence about how women are thought of in the church. It's not just that they are the ones who brought the evil into the world, but woman also functions in a positive kind of way. You have that, that difficulty, though, for males in Christian circles to figure out how women are supposed to fit into the picture. I think mean, there was a time when, for example, women were not allowed to sing in the choirs in the church because it was thought that their voices would be seductive somehow and would mess up the uh, decorum and the proper reverence of the service. Oh, well, I mean, why is it that we can't have altar girls these days? Lies behind the idea that we, we could have women distribute 
the Eucharist, but you couldn't have women serve as altar girls. That would be interesting to know what the psychology is behind the people who would claim that. I'm not so sure it doesn't have some of that traditional notion in it yet of, of the women as the temptress and uh, the ones that are going to cause the trouble somehow. Well, that's uh, some of the ideas about maybe how we get to this uh, idea of patriarchy and uh, <coughs> what holds it up. I think that uh, maybe I've said enough about all of that um, to sort of set the stage because the dominant thing is to see what the tradition is able to do for us in trying to overcome all of this. Let me just take up one final idea Bob, from Rosemary Ruther that she thinks is a bad way of dealing with this sexism. And the bad way she sees it is this attempt uh, to, for males and men and women to become more androgynous, as we say. A lot of this thought comes from Carl Jung, and it's very in, and many people use it. It's uh, popularized in this way, that the way we're going to move forward is for men to get in touch with their anima. Uh, men are going to get in touch with their soft and feminine side. And therefore, as we men do that, then uh, the world is going to run better and we're going to get along and so on. By the same token, women are advised to get in touch with their animus, that is, their assertive, more aggressive sign. And that is, I mean, you hear that talk all over the place these days. It, it comes from Carl Jung, the psychotherapist, and many of his popularizers. And again, Rosemary Ruther is just death on that. Rosemary Ruther thinks that that really is going to mess everything up. She says all that does is play into the stereotypical idea that there are these certain female characteristics and certain male characteristics. And that all you're doing is perpetuating the stereotypes and telling people that they have to function in a certain way that women just aren't normally and naturally aggressive, that they have to sort of become that way. It just sets up, in her mind, a whole stereotypical notion of what is male and female. Rosemary, along with many of the other feminists, as you might know, uh, does not like any talk of male-female distinctions. Um, I guess I've said this story enough that, that Rosemary and I were in a debate on this one time, and I suggested to Rosemary that uh, the uh, that women who had children had a special kind of experience, and to give birth was a marvelous thing, and it probably colored their perception of God and and uh, who God was for them, and so on. And Rosemary looked at me and said, "Bullshit." <laughs> which I interpreted to be like <laughs> closing off dialogue. <laughs> I didn't really know if I read her right or not. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, it's, it, it makes the point a lot. I mean, but Rosemary later on explained to me why this is. And then why do you need that kind of reaction? And it makes all the sense in the world to me. And that is that, and it's one of the reasons I've taken the tack that I'm using in the second part. But Rosemary said, as soon as the, those who are dominated, or they who are in the lower part of the dualistic polarity here, allow the ones on the top to define the agenda or set the framework for the discussion, or pull out the categories, or define the terms. As soon as they let them do that, they will lose. And therefore, what Rosemary says is that women can never let men define the agenda. Can't let men shape the discussion, because as soon as they do, then they will always lose. They will, uh, they, they will always be slanted away from them. It'd be interesting to check out discussions if, uh, Men and women think back to conversations, just arguments about things. 
and how the, the discussion gets shaped and uh, who, de who determines the dominant categories usually determines who wins the debate and the discussion. I think it's a, it makes a great logical sense to me. Anyway, Rosemary is not for this Jungian idea of androgyny that is trying to uncover our fe feminine pole for males and vice versa for women. That isn't the way to do it. What you want to do is allow people to be people and allow people to have their characteristics whatever they are and that uh, you don't have to name them feminine or masculine, just allow human beings to use whatever talents, skills uh, they've been given by their creator and don't name them because as soon as you do, that's going to set one set of the categories in a lower inferior position. You'll end up with another kind of dualism. Okay, I want to uh, stop there and uh, take a... Let me just see if there's any questions. No, let's take a break and I'll come back and see if there's any questions. Let's take a couple of minute break. But that it doesn't challenge... It has no social bite to it. It doesn't get around to saying, well, we got to change this or stop pollution or uh, overcome the, the uh, patriarchal domination. I think that, that's the point. That, the, the Romantic movement didn't have any sense of social criticism. And, and it didn't m move us to liberation uh, causes. And therefore it leaves the world as it is. It, it's the differences, I was talking last week, between St. Uh, Francis and St. Benedict. You know that, remember that for some people, Lynn White, for one, Lynn White Jr., the way, uh, for one, said that his idea was well, you got to be like Francis. If you're like Francis, then you will reverence nature and, and have great regard for it and so on. But then uh, Dubois came along and said, well, we don't, say, uh, we don't need Francis, we need St. Benedict as our monk. Because St. Benedict's monastery self-contained. They reclaimed the land, irrigated and care of it, and grew their uh, food and, and created a contained society. In other words, they found proper intermediate knowledge. changed the way they didn't just let it. So that is almost like a Marxist notion, you know, as Marx said, well, we don't want to just contemplate the world, you know, we got to change it, that's what counts. And so I think that's what the modern uh, feminist movement, looking back on romanticism in the previous age, would say they didn't do anything to change it, they just contemplated it. Any other question before we go on? All right, now, my uh, attempt to find it, and this is in two parts, and uh, first of all, I want to draw on the thought of Rosemary Ruther, and I think her best book by far is Sexism and God Talk. It is the most systematic effort to understand patriarchy and sexism, and the most systematic, coherent effort we've had yet to mobilize the Christian tradition and various uh, categories of theology to try to do something about it. The contrast here is between Rosemary Ruther and Matthew Fox again, uh, as the way they would approach this. Rosemary Ruther's approach is very systematic and clear-cut and has a certain rational character about it. As we'll see, Matthew Fox, that's not his strength. He comes at it in a much more poetic way than Rosemary Ruther would second reason for doing it this way is to make sure that there is a woman's voice in the picture uh, so that uh, we don't fall into the trap that Rosemary Ruther said could easily happen, that is, in which males try to figure out what the problem is and how to solve it. Uh, so that one of Rosemary's major principles is that women have to define the problem themselves and to take hold of the way they're going to uh, overcome the difficulty. So, what Rosemary has done fundamentally is take the major theological categories and rethink them in a way that slants towards the found cause. The overarching theological principle is that anything in the tradition that hurt women is excluded. The norm, I mean, if, if any of the tradition hurts women, in church tradition, the Christian tradition, Bible in there, and it's a detriment, then it must be wrong. On the other hand, anything you find in there that will help them to achieve liberation, that's good. 
Now that is the most radical approach to uh, the Bible that we've had yet. Um, but anyway, in other words, it's a tremendous uh, undertaking that Rosemary Ruther has uh, attempted here. Uh, Rosemary Ruther is, a, I mean, is a tremendous theologian, a broad thinker, and uh, has done something that uh, no one else really has ever tried to do. Uh, she has not been totally successful, of course, but we have to sort of appreciate the extent of what she's doing. In other words, you see what she's doing is rereading the whole biblical tradition, the whole Bible, and even back before that, the pre-biblical religions and the whole Christian tradition since from a perspective that's never been used before. That is the perspective of women. And that's... Uh, you could contrast that going to get to the... I better go on here. I've carried away. <laughs> anyway, whatever she did, it's important. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the first thing is we got a, a, a picture of God. Now, there's a sort of standard picture of God that um, God is the supreme being. And he's up at the top of this whole hierarchy thing. And there's God, and then there's angels, and then there's men, and then there's women, and then there's non-human living things, and work your way down. So it's a hierarchy of being, and God is the supreme being, and God sort of, everything emanates out.